Good afternoon, and thank you for joining our discussion today on skills for the future in MENA's changing workforce. Um, I'm Marissa Khurma, and I'm currently leading the Middle East program at the Wilson Center. This discussion is co-hosted uh, with our partners in the world of workforce development, Localized. Uh, and for those of you who don't know much about Localized, it's an online platform that connects employers and experts with job seekers and the talent of tomorrow. Um, it is an essential player in the workforce development um, ecosystem, particularly in the MENA region. Today, MENA governments continue to grapple with acutely high unemployment rates, especially amongst um, the educated youth, outdated educational and, six, and skills development systems, as well as asymmetrical economic growth. And these are some of the key dimensions of the workforce challenge but today we will be zooming in to discuss skills and skills developments, particularly for the future. The Wilson Center's report on MENA's workforce development, um, Ready for Work, that we published last December, identified the skills mismatch as a critical component of this problem. And today, as the MENA region grapples with a worrisome economic downturn due to the coronavirus pandemic, this conversation on skills is ever more pertinent. So how can the region capitalize on uh, digitization and the skills transformation in order to bounce back from the pandemic? And as governments have become increasingly constrained, particularly due to the pandemic, how can the private sector play a role in reskilling and upskilling the workforce? So we're very much looking forward to hearing um, uh, all of you, the experts, um, to help us navigate some of these uh, questions. I'm delighted to introduce um, our panelists today uh, and moderator, uh, starting with um, our moderator, Ronit Avni, who's the founder and uh, CEO of Localized. She's a tech and media entrepreneur and an, a Peabody Award winning producer. Um, Arif uh, Boalwan is Senior Manager of Digital Transformation and Strategy at Consolidated Contractors Company, CCC, which, uh, which is the top construction company in the Middle East. Arif is also a Strategy Officer at the World Economic Forum. And joining us from um, Europe is Manuel uh, Lagendorf, a researcher and writer on um, the MENA region, former editor of the World Weekly, and until recently a visiting fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. So welcome, and thank you so much for your time today. Renit, I will hand this over to you to kick off this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marissa. Can you all hear me all right? Perfect, okay, so thanks to you. Thanks to the Wilson Center for hosting this very important discussion. Uh, the question of how the MENA region not only survives the economic challenges of the moment with COVID-19 and the highest youth unemployment rate in the world, but also turns this era of exponential change into an opportunity is top of mind for policymakers, for educators, and university administrators across the MENA region. So it's really wonderful to be able to be in conversation with uh, our two esteemed panelists. So Arif, I'd like to start with you. Uh, your work, you work for the leading construction company in the region, and it would be great to hear why do you see this as a critical issue right now, and how can the private sector play a role in reskilling and upskilling the workforce? Uh, thank you, Ronit. Uh, thank you, Marisa, for the introduction. Uh, Ronit, as Marisa said, the challenges are obvious, especially in the Middle East. The, the talent gap that we have between what's required to run your business and what uh, uh, education level or skills uh, acquired by, by either labor, skilled, uh, white color, uh, blue color uh, staff uh, is, is a big challenge for everybody. Uh, there are many reasons why this is essential. First, from a, a, a top company in the Middle East, this comes with a responsibility. When you're a leader in, 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 in the region, you have to act like a leader. Uh, second, from business perspective, when we operate in a country, whichever is, and we, don't, we cannot find the right talent, then we have to uh, import expats. And this is uh, a big overheads uh, that would affect your profitability, 
in the first place and your productivity because they do not understand the local market, they do not understand the local culture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The third and most importantly, I think, our responsibility to the local communities where we operate. So whenever we uh, we run training program, whichever it is, and we can promote uh, uh, the skill set of uh, the staff and labor in the areas where we operate, it's win win for everybody. And uh, most importantly, uh, being a leader in the Middle East, we focus on rather than being better than the average, we focus on uh, why don't we raise up the whole average? Why don't we try to, uh, to help everybody uh, to do a better job? Fantastic. Um, that is, that's very helpful. And, and I look forward as we dig in a little bit later to talk about where those specific skills gaps are from your perspective. But just turning to Manuel for, for a moment, as a scholar of this issue, first, can you help us to understand, uh, before we go into the challenges of the digital transformation, what do you see as the, the requirements of the moment? Where do you see the most acute need for transformation? What are the skills? What are the sectors? And then we can go into the challenges uh, that uh, are related uh, to those needs. Yeah, thank you. And also thank you to Marissa and, and everyone from the Wilson Center for hosting this and, and Ronit for, for sharing. Um, I think I'd like to start by saying that COVID-19 and, and the lockdowns that have happened have really pushed digital transformation up the agenda and it's become um, you know, more important than ever. And it's been an interesting time to observe what sectors in, in the private sector have been able to fare quite well by using their digital offerings and expanding them um, across the region. When we, for example, look at education, health, um, or um, other sectors like uh, communication. Um, and so I think we have sort of um, amongst this push, we, we really have actually in, in the region a fairly good basis when it comes to internet access has increased quite significantly. It is when we come to the challenge, there's quite a ways to go in certain areas, but um, a lot of, especially the younger generation, is already quite tech savvy and, and knows how to use um, technology like social media. Um, but at the same time, I think there is, and, and Arif already touched upon this indirectly, I believe, um, you know, there is a need really for government and the private sector to cooperate more. And so, you know, the, the private sector knows better than anyone what the skills are that are lacking. For example, when it, what happens is that many people graduate from university have uh, sometimes multiple degrees, but still there is a mismatch um, between the job market and, and what is, is being produced in the education system. And so I would I would say to start with, we really need more cooperation in that realm sort of to help to have the private sector be involved in designing curriculums, leading workshops. Um, Fantastic. Um, so one thing that our team has observed, uh, Marissa touched upon uh, localized being a, a, a company that interacts with government, we interact with universities and employers. And when you ask employers what it is that they're looking for, one of the biggest gaps that we see is the answer of soft skills or essential skills that, that um, we're seeing gaps in things like data science, uh, AI, you know, the very cutting edge uh, uh, technological skills, but also the soft skills, understanding what are the norms, the workplace norms, the, the professionalism, et cetera. And I, I would be curious, RF, turning back to you for a moment, can you talk about, uh, you know, there are different sectors that have different norms and different requirements. There's the blue collar workers, there are white collar workers. Can you break down for us where you see the gaps in these various demographics and where you see some opportunities there? And, and at some point, I'll share with you some of the strategies that we're seeing uh, certain governments adopting, certain universities adopting, but it would be great for us to collectively over the course of this conversation to start to surface some of the best practices that we're seeing uh, so that they can be perhaps uh, expanded across uh, whether it's national lines uh, or, or regionally. 
So RF, uh, turning over to you, just thinking about the different demographics and the skills gaps when you think about blue collar, white collar, et cetera. Uh, yeah, yeah, Rune, very, very true. Uh, regarding the white collar, if I start uh, with that, uh, we, yeah, we have realized if I take uh, construction uh, as an example, and then I can go into more uh, uh, cross industry uh, regarding the leadership and emotional intelligence, which I would apply to an industry. If I take construction, for, for, for example, which is we know in the Middle East traditionally the biggest two industries were oil and gas and construction. Now we see, of course, other evolving uh, technology innovation, but this is traditionally this is this is the most uh, uh, required job in the Middle East uh, in the in the last uh, probably 30, 40 years. Uh, so if we if we take construction, we realize that uh, in the last many years people are less less reluctant to uh, to join from high school to universities and join engineering degrees. We have realized that from statistics. Uh, so we even have to go back to uh, to school to high school. And that's what we've done in collaboration, for instance, with, with Lebanese American University, which I'm adv advisory counsel for the University for Computer Science. We went back to the high school and we made summer school, summer, summer camps uh, to promote engineering, to encourage more uh, 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 students to enroll for engineering. Because without student enrolling, and you know, if you have the best university in the world, the student who defines the standard more than anything else. So you want more students to enroll to select be better students. And to so even started from, from high school. And then you would go to the, uh, the pre-graduate the last year before graduation, be it BE or ME. And then we have developed a training, uh, a summer training uh, uh, that would come for three months over our camp and, and practice uh, before they graduate from the university. So this bridge huge gap three months between what they learn theoretically and what's happening in the real world. So whenever they graduate, even if we don't offer them the opportunity, they can, they're, they're much more uh, employable by other, because many other big companies, they would want to see that experience uh, realized by them. And then if we go even further, when we employ the staff, we have to take them, and that's what we do, do, do something we call, let's say, graduate under development program. It's two, three years orientation program. We don't want a fresh graduate from a reputable universities and engineering to go and do one discipline only. You want them in the first few years uh, uh, because they might not know the best thing is for uh, one of the books says that only lucky ones know their their strength so unless you go and 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 orient uh, that uh, that student that fresh graduate i mean on different disciplines you would might never realize where the areas of thing where they might fight so there are development programs that will take them uh, during that and there is a leadership program later that would focus more on emotional intelligence, leadership skills, uh, supervisory skills, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, that, that's what one comes to uh, an example in the, uh, in, in the engineering and in, in the engineering and construction industry, for instance. But if I talk to all industries, we, there's definitely a, a uh, 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 there's definitely a trend in the Middle East that we realize uh, from, uh, uh, there are definitely very good universities, but many universities, uh, graduate the best engineers, uh, but you always have a problem in the, for instance, the English language, and that that's a challenge. Uh, you uh, to join an international company if you don't. So you have, many times we do training English, as simple as that. Uh, you find brilliant guys with distinction. They've done great innovation, but they cannot translate their ideas. So you might go even to that basics, uh, and and definitely uh, communication and leadership skills. So these two are definitely uh, the now if we speak about the Middle East, the last few years, we see a big change. And if I may touch on what uh, Manuel has said about digital transformation, uh, uh, you know that uh, now the Middle East is much one, um, that's why I'm very optimistic in the future of the Middle East because uh, it's one of the most growth, uh, demographic growth area in the world. Many countries you have like 70% less than 30 years old. So you have the millennial generation plus generation Z, they're the majority of the population. And they're, uh, they're all when it comes to digital transformation that is native. native. Uh, uh, even if I'm, 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 I come from an IT background, whenever I have faced problem with my smartphone, I seek my, my, uh, my 13 years old son to help me. He knows really better than I do with all these uh, uh, small things. So that's the generation we, we see now in the Middle East. That's why we're very much optimistic. And you see the visions of the many of the wealthy countries in the, in the region a very sound vision, like Saudi 2030 vision, uh, the UE similarly, the Mars mission. The first time we have in the in the, in the Middle East region a minister for uh, for artificial intelligence. Uh, so that's in in in, uh, in in UE, of course. So all these things we see 
uh, will will help a lot. Digital transformation will help a lot. Uh, everything I talked about will mitigate it ultimately. Unfortunately, many countries. So we see this top bottom approach in many of the wealthy countries for for that. Unfortunately, in many uh, other countries, uh, there is an absence from the public sector. Uh, uh, when it comes to, to the awareness of what, let's say, uh, Dubai is doing uh, uh, far, uh, just, just as if you're in different uh, uh, part of the world, although you might be a very neighboring country. So uh, here we see a, a more bottom-up approach, and we see the startups are, are stepping in and taking leadership and disrupting many industries. And we hear so many success stories now in the Middle East from, from countries we never imagined that we could see such an innovation and, and high tech coming. Uh, uh, so that's why I'm always optimistic about the, the, the future of the Middle East. It's because of the future generation, that's all. So to go back to, to your question regarding uh, the, the blue color, the blue color is a big challenge uh, 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 for everybody. And, and the reason is that uh, uh, we don't have craft. It's, it's, it's not part of the culture of some countries. Some countries, yes, you find it. You, I'm not going to name which one in the Middle East, in the MENA region. Some countries, you, you find it, you realize that in the culture. You can find any craft you want. You want a welder, you want a pipe fitter, you want an electrician. Other countries, uh, maybe because traditionally, uh, historically, I mean, they lived on trades, On uh, there is a huge absence of that. And imagine if you want a, a very simple uh, uh, blue, uh, blue color to import the tax. While there are thousands of people unemployed and they're uneducated, and they can be very easily uh, 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 reskilled or upskilled to do the job. And that's why, and this is our strategy, is that we put a, a set of objectives. And I would really encourage any uh, uh, private uh, sector, uh, going back also to, uh, to what Manuel said about the private sector responsibility, uh, what they can do. And this is really a win to the company itself, not only a CSR perspective. So it's, uh, uh, for instance, uh, it's our interest to maximize the local uh, uh, manpower, uh, to maximize the safety uh, and quality of our operation, to transfer the knowledge to, uh, to the local community where we operate, to empower them with, with, with skill set that uh, uh, will, will, will open for them a career development, et cetera, et cetera. So what we've done is we've done for, for Blue Color permanent training centers in many countries. We have now permanent training center in, in Oman, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, in the West Bank. Uh, almost uh, most of the uh, areas where we operate. And there are continuous uh, uh, training, even if we don't have jobs, even if we're not employing that period, okay? And it really pays off. We many times um, uh, get a job after five years, and then we realize that there are many people that we can employ that we trained already because we keep record. So, uh, so it's not only a CSR thing, and this is what I'm trying to promote here. It's good for the business, okay? Besides being great for the society, uh, uh, and, and, and definitely a CSR uh, object. Fantastic. And, and so much of what you're saying resonates. A, a couple of anecdotes that I think uh, would be of relevance. Our, so our team at Localized, we connect university students to industry experts and employers. And when coronavirus hit, we're in touch with many governments. And I have to say that I am optimistic like you for the MENA region because the rate of adoption of new technologies and experimentation that took place in MENA as a result of COVID was remarkable. And we actually operate in several other regions of the world. I won't name names, but MENA was the fastest. And, and I don't just mean the GCC. I mean all the way from, you know, from Beirut to Bahrain, from Amman all the way through um, the adoption of going virtual, going remote. We, I, we had one conversation with a government official who was giddy because he said he had never seen seen so much openness to creativity and change in his career working in government that coronavirus unleashed an opportunity and an openness to try new things, to do new things, to do things differently. Um, some places where you had to have 10 meetings and coffee meetings before you, you got something done, suddenly they were doing it on Zoom immediately within an hour. And so the energy that we felt, obviously concern, and certainly in economies, places like Jordan, there is a, a deep concern about the economic situation and the stability and, and, and all of that. But also there, there is a deep opportunity. Uh, so I share your optimism. I think the other piece that I share that is going to require attention is 
sometimes the barrier to entry is something very small. So a concrete example on our end, we work with a lot of hiring managers in places like Dubai for the MENA region, you know, where it's a headquarters of a company looking to hire across the region. And they'll be looking at, they can recruit on our platform, they can find talent. And just as you said, you might have excellent engineers in places like Palestine or Egypt, for example, really phenomenal engineers, but their English skills are not great to the point where you may not know that you should capitalize your first letter and last letter, you know, your first name and your last name, right? Which because there's no capitalization in Arabic, but in English capitalization is a signal that you know the language. So something as simple as, an employer goes to your profile and your name is not capitalized, says to them, you don't speak English and you're not going to be able to communicate with a cross-functional team. And it's so small, but it's instantaneous and it turns off a, a recruiter. So those tiny interventions that give people an understanding of what the social norms are, the engineers are perfectly capable of doing these things if they're aware that it's important. And there needs to be more of that translation happen. So we're gonna, we're gonna go into that in a few minutes and, and dig into some more practical suggestions. I think what you're doing at CCC, what you're describing is fantastic. The idea of lifting the knowledge base, uh, that's, we need it, we need more of it. Uh, and, and more and more companies, and you see this in the pharma sector, you see this in AI, more companies are stepping in across MENA to have internship programs, to have training programs, to partner with universities. It is exciting, it's not sufficient. Uh, so with the challenges in mind, Manuel, I'd like to turn to you uh, because there are lots of reasons to be optimistic as RF had laid out, but there are also some areas for caution. Uh, what would be some of those uh, um, areas that may concern you or that you think we should keep an eye on as these transformations and, and adoptions of new processes take place? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I absolutely overall share that optimism. Um, however, I think that there are a couple of points that we should pay attention to and where there is an important role for government, civil society, and private sector in the region, but also, where, and, and maybe we can discuss that later, where outside actors can actually play a positive role. Um, and so the, the starting point is, and, and since we're talking about skills, I, I do think, um, it is still, of course, and, and that's across the region in public education system, too much focus in the um, education system on uh, memorization and test results. So thinking about critical thinking, problem solving, and, and I very much like what both of you said earlier, and I would say the earlier we can start integrating these type of ideas to sort of say, uh, yes, will need these hard skills as an engineer, as an IT software de developer, but really what it should teach you as well is to think critically, to maybe think how would you act in a team to sort of approach a topic. And I, I think it needs to be more of that and also not just for a certain segment of society that can afford this maybe higher end education, so to speak, but is, is just relying on, on public education. Um, and so, and again, I, I think this sort of working together, so uh, civil society, the government and the private sector can, can really make a difference here. Um, another issue that, that I'm concerned about is um, inclusion. So uh, broadly speaking, when we think about digital transformation, um, there are a couple of divides that have already unfortunately happened in the region and in, in other parts of the world. So one is on the issue of gender. Um, so if we look at statistics and, and so, um, between the two genders uh, internet, on internet usage, um, the gap is increasing, which means that more um, girls and, and women have a harder time to access the internet, so are more likely to be left out of this digital transformation and, and will have a harder time to access uh, jobs in this, in this new economy. Um, and similarly, um, on the issue of infrastructure, I think sort of the, the Gulf, the GCC countries are, are sort of quite advanced and of course are already in talks about um, 5G technology or, or have already implemented that partly, but in other parts of the MENA region, um, the situation doesn't quite look as good. Uh, I mean, 
3G coverage is widely available. But if we're really sort of talking about uh, using this digital transformation in an economic sense, um, that is not quite enough. And so other areas, especially rural areas, are still lagging behind when it comes to internet access. And um, the majority of the digital economy uh, is already happening um, in, in the capitals, in the urban areas. So there is a danger that those that don't have uh, access sort of to, to these areas will be left behind. Um, and I think that, that is something, these two issues when it comes to inclusion are quite important um, and there needs to be more work done on that. Um, I also think, and maybe this is not just relevant for the digital economy, and, and I would be curious actually to, to hear Aras' views on this, is um, the ease of doing business. Um, so when we think of the digital economy, of course, the borders matter less, but if you want to set up a base in a different country, you, you need to register, you need to sort of hire talent. And I, I do think sort of the lack of a common regulatory environment across the region still can at least slow down uh, business expansion, especially when we, when you talk to sort of young companies that don't quite have the capital yet to, to invest um, a lot to sort of set up a new base. Um, I think there are still obstacles in that realm. And, and similarly, um, when it comes, these, these might seem sometimes like small things, but things like um, blocking um, certain voice over IP services like WhatsApp calls or, or Skype can also just add to the cost of doing business. So I think these, these are some of the sort of points that, that I would like to stress. Excellent. Um, thank you, Manuel. And just a reminder to our audience that you can post your questions on Twitter with the handle at Wilson Center MEP. So once again, it's at Wilson Center MEP. Please go ahead and, and post your questions. And Manuel, talking about the digital divide, that's, that's critical and the gender divide on that is critical. One perhaps silver lining or, or positive uh, development uh, is that in MENA, or maybe, maybe it's not positive there, it's just worse here, but you're more likely to get investment dollars as a female founder in MENA than you are uh, in North America. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say things are equal there, but, um, but and perhaps it, it's just a commentary on, on where we are, but you are seeing a lot of female founders in the region you're seeing them getting more of a, a um, capital as an overall percentage of, of investment dollars, uh, but still something that's critical and, and definitely in the last mile scenarios of internet connectivity where it has a, a real survival implications, um, that's critical to, to be able to have that access. Going back to your comments about uh, starting early, not, not dealing with just rote learning. One of the things that uh, I, I've been thinking about quite a bit, we work with universities all across the region. So we've got partnerships in Tunisia, in Lebanon, Palestine, Egypt, Jordan, uh, the GCC, uh, Oman, et cetera. And so we're seeing the universities, public and private. And, and overall, I think that there's a real desire for the universities to be innovative, to be connected to the world, to be plugged in. So I think that, that the, the question of um, innovation, agency, non-remote, uh, non-rote learning has to start much earlier. That you know, the transformation is happening at the university level. The professors are willing, by and large, the administrations are, are, are willing. You're seeing some very interesting models in Jordan for example, HTU, uh, the Al Hussein Technical University, has a year of practical learning where you actually have to go and work in the workforce in order to graduate, but that's a, a, um, it's a, a condition of graduation. So we are seeing a lot of forward thinking best practices at the university level. The problem starts earlier. And, um, and uh, you know, I and Araf, turning back to you for a moment, there are schools and schools of thought around the world where even at age four, age five, age seven, students are doing user-centered design. They're given problems that they have to solve. You know, I, I can just give you an example that I know of where a pre-kindergarten class was tasked, not in MENA, to develop and design a podium. And they actually had to go and speak to 
the principal and the students and they had to talk to different stakeholders and come up with a design for what a podium should look like. And because they were four and they sit in strollers all day long, their podium came with an arm, like a stroller arm that held water, the way that strollers hold water bottles, right? Which was a very interesting innovation uh, for four-year-olds. Now, the reason I'm, I'm going off on that is to say that, that there are ways to give children agency to foster their creativity and to, to, to give them a sense that they have control over their surroundings, that they can contribute and be productive. And the reason that that's important, which I know you know, is that as artificial intelligence, as um, uh, technology supplants human um, uh, jobs, those jobs that are going to remain standing are the ones that require problem solving, collaboration, creativity, right? So even if we learn the coding skills, at some point, that's going to be taken over by algorithms. But the ability to influence your, your environment and to, um, to have that agency is critical. I'm curious, Arif, if you're seeing that at a younger level, how can we foster that? Are there some best practices that you're aware of? Um, and what questions should we be asking when it comes to the education system before the university level? And even perhaps before you mentioned the high school program, which is fantastic, but should we be starting earlier? We should definitely be starting earlier, earlier uh, Ronit. I totally agree. And I will come back to Manuel to, uh, to answer him as he asked me a question regarding this transformation. Uh, answering your question, Ronit, uh, uh, definitely we can, even if we talking about coding because you're talking about coding there are many websites now like scratch like uh, code.org like that will teach kids how to program without coding which proves your point and uh, 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 one of the thing i said in one of the uh, uh, keynotes i spoke at, at leu in beirut is saying the arts of computer science that i see personally i'm a computer science graduate i see computer programming as an art rather than a science uh, and and if you think about it this is where the creativity comes, what you're touching on. And this starts from very early on. But here, maybe we have to go be, even before school. You said, let's go to early time school. Let's go home. Okay, let's go home. Let, let's understand the culture. And, and uh, is, uh, are we talking about the culture that uh, uh, it's okay to do mistake? Do we encourage mistake? Or we, we want to raise kids who are uh, never do mistakes? Uh, so if we don't want to do mistakes, if we want to be the perfect kid, we'll never be creative. As Elon Musk said once, that if you're not failing, you're not doing anything new. So if we can promote that culture from home, before school, to the school, because the, the teacher in the Middle East are parents as well. Uh, so if they, if they do not practice that to their kids, which they would love most in the world, they would never love the students more than their kids. If they can do that to their kids, they would not do it to the students. That's the way. Now we're definitely privileged in the Middle East with some very good schools. But that's to who can afford that schools? What's the percentage of society that can afford the good school that promotes that culture that you're talking about, Ronit? So I think here you want to go back. And I think you want to have a, a, a very in-depth study and, and, and uh, raising awareness uh, through webinars, through influencers, uh, that I think we see that's happening. But definitely want to see it much more. And we needed uh, much, much more. Uh, now, uh, uh, going back, uh, so go, you said something about even uh, uh, supporting innovation at the at the university level. I think one of the best things that happened in the Middle East is the trend of startup in, in some in some countries. Why? Before that trend happened, and we had the incubator, accelerators, venture capital, etc. Cetera, et cetera, before that ecosystem. Uh, was established in, in, in some countries in the, in the MENA region. The only thing that you could promote good idea university is basically to have fun from the industry. And this is what made MIT, MIT and Harvard, Harvard, all the research and development are funded by, by, the, by the industry, by different industries around. Which industry are we talking about in the Middle East that would fund these universities? How many industries? Are we, are we inventing rockets or manufacturing cars? So what kind of industries we can? We, okay, we can probably sponsor, and we do uh, in, in construction and in engineering and in oil and gas. I, I'm talking traditionally. Now, when it comes to startup, that's the amazing thing that happened. If you have an idea, all the new generation understand that uh, the more, even when before they graduate, and and now uh, uh, I'm gonna connect to Manuel's question here uh, that the MENA region is many region MENA region. There are three MENA regions, if I may say. 
uh, uh, Manuel said there is no penetration of internet. We need more. Uh, penetration of internet in some countries and smartphones is more than 100%. All over the MENA region is 65%. But this is not evenly distributed, and Manuel is right. So you can see a country which is 100%, while another country, without mentioning the name, you have big, far bigger percentage than 35 without internet. So uh, it's not evenly distributed. If we talk to Dubai, uh, a few months back only, I'm living in Greece, there are uh, even, and talking about inclusion, uh, Manuel, uh, two Greek uh, fresh graduates, uh, one, one girl and one boy, traveled to Dubai only to establish their startup. That's, the, the, that's amazing. We never saw this five years back. And they called their startup InstaShop. And these two Greek entrepreneurs exited last month or two, two, three months back with $380 million or euro. I forget the, the exact number. For, for, this is something amazing that someone would fly from Europe the MENA region to establish a startup and exit back with hundreds of millions of dollars. But is the region Dubai? I wish. I wish that Dubai can be a role model uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the ecosystem. I'm talking about the startup and to be replicated in, in the Middle East, uh, all over the Middle East. So uh, talking about uh, uh, inclusion uh, also, when we have in some countries penetration of smartphones more than 100%, we will have more entrepreneurs, of course, of course. And you're, you're definitely right, uh, Ronit. Now we see even more entrepreneurs and they, 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 can have, they can raise funds easier uh, because simply, uh, uh, and there are other things other than technology. For instance, we wanted to balance, you know, construction is a man's job since ages, it's a man's job. So we wanted to change that image for CC. Uh, we definitely have some, uh, uh, some women in our jobs, but in the remote area, if you're operating in the desert, that's not every, uh, a woman would accept to live in, in that condition in the first place. So what we've done is that instead of thinking horizontal across all trades, we thought what trades we can make a difference. For instance, BIM, building information modeling. This is happens in the back office. So we have three major offices, one in West Bank, one in Egypt, uh, one in, in Greece, that we could employ the majority, more than 60, 70% uh, women. Because, so you can go into trade by trade as an organization, private sector. But... Uh, 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 but the public sector cannot solve this problem alone. It's a public-private collaboration going. And this is, I would connect to Manuel's question about digital transformation in the region. Uh, uh, the, the biggest problem we have that some government are still, the, the, the system is still very outdated. And even if they have automation, uh, many people confuse automation with digital transformation. Even if you have the best system in place and everything is automated, I, you can ask a few questions, a few simple questions. How many times any government would ask you for the same information more than once? Ask so that simply. How many times you need to visit a government office? I will take Estonia and Europe. I'm, I'm not talking about uh, uh, Northern Europe or, or Western Europe. I'm going to take Estonia as an example. For the last seven years, nobody visited, almost none of the Estonian visited their, their government offices. Everything happened online. They have digital identity. They started with the basics. Digital identity to identify who are you running. I, every time I need to ask you for five, six documents to, 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 to realize that you're running or, or, or there is a better way of doing that. Uh, uh, we don't uh, uh, ask you for the same information more than once. We don't store that information more than once. So if we can, there are basics that government um, we can speak hours. I'm not going to uh, hijack the, 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 the talk now. But, but there are basics that governments can ask themselves these questions to understand if they're in the right direction when it comes to digital transformation or they're just automating bad processes. If a process is taking you down, when you automate it, you go down even faster. So beware of what you, what you want, you might get it. Here, there are the, the right strategy and even in the most uh, advanced countries in the MENA region and in Europe, we still find challenges in the public sector. It takes very, very bold leadership uh, to, to push that sector uh, uh, forward and back to Manuel. And only then opening new business for the private sector will be smooth because this is what scare private sector. The hidden thing they do not understand when they come to any countries. That's, I think that that's very constructive and, and concrete. And I, I also agree with Manuel that 
that, and both of you, that, that clarity and transparency around policy, predictability and efficiency, those are all things that are important in any sector anywhere in the world. And the more that you can automate what is automatable, but, but what you're saying digitize and consolidate and make simpler and um, remove the friction so that if something where you're constantly having to interface with government agencies to get your permits and to do all of those things, if that can be reduced, and clarified, and, and to Manuel's point, if that can also be uh, perhaps under an umbrella of consistency that is regional, so that if you have a startup in Egypt that wants to expand into Jordan and into the GCC, that it's much more easy to navigate so that you know how you can how you can do that? How can you collect money legally? How can you pay people legally? How can you set up shop legally? So the, the simpler, and that's true anywhere, right? The simpler and clearer it is to be able to operate, uh, and certainly with a regional framework, the, the more you're eliminating barriers uh, and friction. We have some questions that are coming in right now, so I would love to uh, begin to address them. So the first question comes from Deirdre Conley, who's asking, how can a country like Tunisia use digital platforms to create jobs locally? And which sectors make sense in a location without complete security on the ground and with tourism no longer the answer? So I would love either Manuel or, or Arif if you have a preference uh, specifically on, on Tunisia. Uh, I don't have a specific uh, answers for Tunisia, but I would uh, answer something. The uh, uh, because part of the description of the of today's good talk is that uh, linking skills to security. It's like chicken or egg, whichever comes first. You can't have probably security without proper skills, but you cannot also promote skills without security. There are basics in life. Uh, uh, so uh, I lived in and in, in, I was raised in Lebanon. And I was three years old when the civil war uh, broke out. And I was 18 when it finished. So I lived 15 years out of the first 18 years of my life in civil war. So I understand what lack of security means. I was privileged to be to come from a family who could afford good education uh, and university, but I was more privileged to stay alive. Uh, so uh, uh, without security, I don't think you can have anything. The first thing we need to stabilize the region, uh, uh, sort out uh, the regional and international uh, 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 conflict that takes place on, in this beautiful region, and then we, we can definitely promote many things. So um, I, I think that that's an, an important perspective. Uh, I would add, um, so we work a lot with Tunisian, both Tunisian universities, a government, uh, agent, a government agency around higher education, and Tunisians abroad. And there's incredible talent. I, I don't need to, to say this, but or it goes without saying that there's incredible Tunisian talent, both in Tunisia and globally. Tunisia, I think, has a lot of potential, even now, um, with regard to uh, tech, tech teams and technological uh, um, teams, because the time difference is very uh, minimal, right? There's a five hour difference from Eastern Standard Time, uh, uh, five, sometimes six, depending upon uh, daylight savings to the region. Um, you have multilingual teams uh, that often speak Arabic, French, English, sometimes a, an, an additional language. And, um, and a hunger. Uh, so for example, there's an initiative called Think It uh, in, in Tunis that has been working with incredibly high caliber engineering teams to work with teams globally that are looking for tech talent. And um, they have um, uh, you know, world-class um, uh, individuals who are able to, to engage with companies and because they're multilingual and the time difference, unlike let's say working in a place like India where the time zone difference from the United States can be 10 and a half hours from uh, Eastern Standard Time or nine and a half hours depending upon when daylight savings takes place. Uh, that's a much harder time zone to operate against if you're trying to collaborate. Whereas with Tunis, it's much more accessible. So I think there's a big opportunity for Tunisia. Um, there are of course a lot of challenges, um, but you know we're seeing both hunger on the part of the students and a desire on the part of Tunisian um, expats to be able to contribute and to, you know, you have groups like Atuj and Type, the Tunisian American Young Professional Associations and others looking to try to connect. So from my perspective, the more that those pieces can be brought together, 
um, the better. I think students need to see and, and aspiring professionals need to see what the what the baseline of professionalism looks like, because when they know what that is, they can rise to it. If you know what the standard is, the talent is there, but the awareness of what the norms are in, a, in an international context, working on a global scale are not always there. Uh, and that's true, frankly, for students everywhere, but, but we see it quite a bit in, in Tunisia. And then there's a language piece, right? Which is um, in a sense, is Tunisia's center of gravity Arabic and French, or is it Arabic and English? Uh, because there's been a reorientation of universities shifting to English in the last few years. Um, there's some growing pains there because uh, the populations aren't yet necessarily at the fluency level um, that is going to be required to have those um, international teams collaborating uh, at scale. So those would be just some of my reflections working with some of the universities in Tunisia and, and some of the um, government agencies. Manuel, is there anything you would want to add or, uh, to that? Yeah, I, I would actually like to just add something on the security question, because I think it's an interesting and important one, especially in the, in the MENA region. And just one example, I think, that, that can help also inclusion is, is the issue of digital payment. So for example, often sort of, and that can also help um, women be more involved. And um, so for example, if digital payments cut out uh, for women and men, um, for example, travel that can be risky or dangerous, or if you have to transport a lot of cash, if you, if you have to collect your salary and there, there might be a risk that you will be robbed or anything. Um, and so the, the usage of digital payment apps that can sort of be uh, used with quite, um, uh, simple uh, mobile phones already, I think is an interesting um, case to be looked at. Um, and, and some countries in the region are already trialing it or using it for um, paying public sector employees as well. That's great. And, and digital payment has been increasing in MENA during COVID. You're seeing that a lot. Contactless payment. Um, getting the unbanked banked regionally is becoming increasingly important, but you're seeing a lot of transformation in the fintech space. I want to turn actually to Marissa. Um, to you, is there anything you would like to add uh, with regard to this question about Tunisia specifically? Thanks, Renit. Um, and thanks uh, uh, to uh, Adif and Manuel for this um, very um, interesting discussion. So there's one thing I wanted to address with regards to um, tourism and security. And I think this is the way forward in the tourism sector worldwide that we're seeing is community driven tourism. And I think when, um, when you know, tourism sites, um, when the government comes in to, uh, to basically upgrade or to organize tourism sites, it is crucial to have civil society organizations and the local community involved. And this is one critical way to also make sure that when everybody is involved, everybody has a stake to uh, promote the safety and security of their own community um, from with, and, and, and definitely also increase the benefits from, um, you know, from that community uh, or for that community. So I think the more we look at innovative ways at how we do tourism differently. We cannot, we don't want to write it off completely as a sector because in Tunisia, it is a very important sector. It has been severely hit by um, obviously the, the, the political developments that we've seen and you know, acts of violence and terrorism that we've seen as well. But I think that community-based and community-driven tourism is definitely the way forward in order to address that issue. Fantastic point. Thank you so much, Marissa. And, and clearly, when we're talking about challenges in the region, these are major challenges. So any of the solutions that we're proposing are a piece of something that is going to take years and decades. And so I, 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 I want to be um, humble to the challenge of it. But all of these pieces, if we layer them one on top of another, over time uh, can, can have a, a meaningful impact and can also spark other creativity and thinking um, uh, to help address them. So we have uh, many additional questions. So I'm gonna move on. Here we go. An, a concern, there's a major concern with the level of IP generation and commercialization of innovation from MENA universities and research and development facilities. So intellectual property, research and development. 
how do the panelists see this solved and accelerated? This will generate quality jobs and reduce brain drain and economic growth. So this is from um, Rami Bujaude. Uh, so thank you, Rami, great question. We started to touch on that a little bit, but it would be great. Arif, why don't we start with you? you, you, you um, when it comes to R&D, uh, we, we did talk about this a little bit, but just going deeper, this idea of um, new breakthroughs, new, new IP, uh, how can we further accelerate that process in the region? Uh, definitely, it takes a public-private collaboration uh, to do that. Uh, we cannot uh, uh, rely only on the private uh, sector. Many, as I said, uh, I think earlier, many of the uh, uh, countries in the Gulf region, we see a very solid and sound uh, top-bottom approach for that, uh, uh, where the government uh, are, are uh, looking to diversify their economy. Uh, by 2030 or whatever 2035 depending on the country and they're they're promoting and investing uh, a lot in innovation universities research and development startups incubator accelerators etc so this is definitely we see it in some of the countries in the region and it's very satisfactory in other parts of the region it's it's a it's a, a it's really a pity to to see a, a complete absence from the government and we see uh, as i said before uh, sometimes a bottom uh, a bottom top approach where some startups and private sector collaborate in order to promote and here uh, maybe I, I can give an example of uh, what the private sector can 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 do on if you like we have established uh, 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 four years back a, a what we call cc startup uh, strategy and it has become a subsidiary of CC Group, a company called uh, CC Startup. And basically what we've done is that part of the World Economic Forum, we foresee what will disrupt the, uh, the engineering and construction uh, industry by 2030. And we did use set of technologies. And then we came and we want to research that technology within the private sector, CCC and with some partners. Then we established within the group a, a committee for each technology and with diversified subject matter experts in order to research that uh, that technology and soon after we research what are the startups in the middle east that are working on technologies on related technologies to that uh, committee and uh, luckily in many times we we found many startups that were working on that and then when we uh, uh, fulfill the three, we have the strategy, we have the committee, uh, which will help the startup bridge the gap with the domain knowledge, because this is usually what the startup uh, required. Uh, we fund a pilot. And uh, we fund the pilot, and many times we succeed and excel. Like we did uh, 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 with localized skilled in Saudi Arabia, the first 3D printed livable house in the world. We executed part of CC strategy. We did in uh, Dubai, we collaborated with Imensa, the manufacturing uh, to, uh, to reverse engineering spare part and 3D print spare part. With Wake Up, a Saudi founder, uh, we did IoT in, uh, for to improve safety and collaboration. Uh, uh, we also did off grid carbon renewable energy in Oman, in Qatar, in, in UAE. So, what we, if, if we can put the strategy uh, for collaboration and bridging gap, because as I said, the biggest problem of innovation in the Middle East is the, uh, the, the lack of industries that will uh, bridge the gap and, 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 and provide the domain knowledge. You find brilliant ideas, brilliant engineers doing research or IT people, but they lack the domain knowledge. And we as, 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 uh, as industry, whatever industry we come from, we're usually too traditionalist to disrupt ourselves. Otherwise, wouldn't be be a, a this traditional industry. And the, and there, and from the other side, you have the domain knowledge gap. So marrying both with this with collaboration strategy, I think that would that would excel. And IPs coming back to IPs, many countries they have very strict legislation. Again, there are more than one Middle East when it comes to everything, and IP is no exception. So we're very satisfied with many countries, how they, they deal with IP, how fast you can register the IP uh, and protect your, uh, your innovation. In some countries, maybe by the time you, you, you finish the, uh, the cycle, it will be stolen, the idea. Maybe someone else would, would, have, would have done it. I love that you gave examples of new IP and new innovation being uh, developed because one of the challenges that you'll find in the startup community is that the most financially successful startups, one could argue are, um, you hear this a lot in the region, copy paste, right? Where you take an existing model and you localize it 
for the MENA region, and you become really expert at executing on it, whether it's deliver food delivery or, or logistics transportation, and then you have an exit where a, the, a larger global player acquires. And we see this over and over again. And those are fantastic success stories of growth and acquisitions, and they're a great model, but they're not necessarily furthering a narrative of breakthrough innovation. And so I think, Araf, what you're saying is very important. The innovation is happening, but there is a funding gap. There may be a role model gap. Maybe there aren't enough examples of exits yet. So the, the appetite, and we saw this after Souk was acquired by Amazon, after Kareem was acquired by Uber, huge influx of entrepreneurs into the space who want to, they, they, they have the hunger, they have the passion, but they also have the role model. There's a vision of a journey, a trajectory that can lead to success, Instashop being, being another example. Now where there's a gap is making sure that those who are hungry to innovate with new IP, new R&D can see a journey to an exit that's successful in order to, to keep that uh, flywheel going in a sense. And that's, it's not that the talent isn't there, it's not that the ideas aren't there, but that continuum requires a lot of pieces of infrastructure to support at every stage. And that's a really critical one. So thank you for, for touching upon that. Manuel, is there anything you, you would like to add to that? I, I just uh, wanted to add, so if, if one of the benefits that, that governments in the private sector, I think, and see if they um, collaborate more on R&D, for example, is also, especially if it's done out, outside the Gulf, is um, the question of talent. And that if there is this infrastructure where there are serious projects, um, you can actually maybe see something like a circular migration. So people that were highly skilled, highly trained, um, but uh, due to a lack of opportunities, um, left to sort of work in other countries, be it in the Gulf or, or in, in the West, and see more opportunities to come back and bring their knowledge and experience back to, um, to um, other countries of the, of the region. So um, just wanted to highlight that as, as one of the benefits if there is an increased focus and also funding in, in that area. Absolutely. Okay. May I add something, Ronit, yes, on this? Yes. Yeah, definitely uh, what you said is very important about the innovation compared to copy paste. Uh, even in copy paste, it's worth mentioning that you can be innovative in the, in the way you do copy paste. Uh, copying, pasting, and localizing, like Soup did, like uh, Amrami did uh, for the region, understanding the taste of the region and the pay model. People don't like to pay by credit card, they've done a different uh, pay, et cetera, et cetera. So even localizing, a copy paste idea, you can be creative and sky is the limit, and even, even in that. So we can promote even creativity in that sense. Absolutely, and it should not be one or the other, but I, I, think, I think we have more of a model of the doing things that have succeeded in other markets. I think more role models in the R&D space that are coming uh, is essential, but absolutely. I mean, it, takes, it still takes a phenomenal amount of creativity, execution, talent, brilliance, most companies fail or most startups fail. So to, to have a successful company period globally, but then to have it on a, on a regional level. Also, you know, I think about Fauri, the payments platform that, uh, you know, it's a billion dollar company, Mohamed Okasha, one of the co-founders from Egypt, they IPO'd on the Egyptian stock exchange, uh, which is not something you hear every day, but it's an incredible success story uh, of a FinTech, an innovative uh, regional FinTech company that has done incredibly well by any measure. So there are many of these examples. We, we want to keep highlighting them so that people get inspired and energized. Um, I see another uh, question that I, I um, so one question, how would parents and schools guide graduating students as they embark on their college journey, other than pushing towards medical science and engineering? Are there tools available to them? And this is from Leila um, Batarse um, from the uh, FDA. Uh, so great question, Leila. Manuel, I'm gonna start with you, work backwards to RF and, and then have a couple of things that I'd like to add. Yeah, I think sort of, it, it there definitely sort of is a lot of merit in sort of going beyond these uh, traditionally sort of um, aspiring, aspiring jobs. And I, I think sort of as the economies in the region are also shifting, and we also see that um, beyond um, 
you know, being being a doctor or a public sector employment, there are more opportunities where you need to be highly skilled and you can sort of um, be valued and, and sort of even be part of an international across regional business. Um, but um, I, I would say it, it's definitely a, from my perspective, I would say it is not an easy process where we can just flick flick a switch and say, okay, now we sort of point to these incentives and, and now we're, we're done with that. So I think it, it will take time, but um, my hope would be that as, as we also, pro so progressing with the digital transformation, um, that these alternatives are becoming more attractive and also acceptable in a way. Great, thank you. Arif, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, sure. Uh, you said that how can we, we uh, promote uh, or, or convince parents not to push their kids to be only engineers and, and, and medicine? That's what that's the question uh, somehow. Uh, well, uh, if, they, if parents do that, they're still living in the industrial age. The industrial age, this is why we cared about math, science, medicine, uh, physics, and, and, and engineering a lot. We're living in the fourth industrial revolution now. Okay, and as you said, uh, run it earlier in the, in, in the talk that now there are new set, sets of skills that's required and many of the things that we do will be automated, of course, except the sports and arts, we always we want to always see sports and arts by human, not by robot. So uh, definitely uh, 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 this is raising awareness to parents that what are the set of skills to prepare your kids for the future, uh, rather than preparing your kids as if we are uh, uh, raising them in the uh, end of the uh, 18th century. Uh, and this is where medicine and and uh, and engineering were the top uh, required talents at the time. That's a great point. Uh, I have a, a story that I, I love from a Jordanian uh, um, head of product marketing for Google uh, in Dubai, and he says that the only reason that he is at Google today is because a when he was a senior, a Microsoft employee came and spoke to his class for an hour, but that employee was also a Jordanian like him. And he needed to see it to be it. You know, there's this idea that if you have, if you have examples, so right now for, for the older generation, uh, medicine and engineering are the examples of esteemed professions, right? If you become a, an engineer, you become a doctor, they're highly respected, uh, you know the work that goes into them. For this generation, I think those role models, in our company, we internally refer to them as proximate role models, people that you look at and you think, okay, if Najib can do it, maybe I can do it too, right? If Mace can do it, maybe that's possible for me too. And so actually, um, and so maybe this is a crude pitch, but, but Leila, because you asked, on Localized, what we do every day is we highlight people like Najib, uh, people like Fadi Gandur, people like Mohamed Okasha and others who come onto the platform and talk about their career journeys. They talk about the skills that you need. They talk about the opportunities and also the next generation. So we've got you know, product managers and we've got AI uh, and CEOs of podcasting companies in MENA. And so we're doing it every day in sports tech, FinTech, et cetera. Out of that conviction, that if you know it's possible, you'll reach for it. But if you don't know it's there, you're never gonna even consider it. And so having those examples is critical. And so we actually work with universities all across the region and youth organizations, groups like Injaz Al Arab and others to provide them with access to those mentors and role models to answer those questions. So that is out there. It's actually free for students to join. So um, just you know, uh, as an FYI. Uh, but I think you're you're absolutely right to be asking that question. Okay, we have. I just, yes, please. Uh, yeah. Excuse me. I just wanted to add add to your point that really that is also one of the important ways I think where we can uh, even further boost uh, female entrepreneurs to really sort of um, help with these networks and show that there are role models um, that come maybe from the from the same country or town. And, and really help them to see that this path is, is very feasible. Absolutely. In fact, we have Rana El Kaliubi is going to be speaking in a couple of weeks. She's the CEO of Affectiva, an AI company. She's Egyptian. And uh, um, Amira Yahyawi, who's a Tunisian, just spoke on Localized a few days ago. And she's an entrepreneur who runs an ed tech company, but had been an activist. 
and Nadia Makbul as well, who runs an architecture firm, a sustainable architecture firm. So we're absolutely thinking about a gender lens and 100% right, we need, we need uh, you know, we are one small uh, piece of a much broader uh, picture that needs to con continue to reinforce these role models. And not just in MENA, th this is something that we need globally, but, but it is also true in MENA. Okay, we have a question from Asher or Kabi who asks, will the recent UAE, Bahrain, Israel uh, peace treaties positively impact education and employment across the region by combining advanced technology and higher learning with Gulf wealth? Uh, so there are lots of dimensions to this question. Uh, it could be a whole hour and a half on its own, um, but maybe if we could just get a couple of uh, quick hits from either one of you, uh, maybe Manuel, if you wanna start. Right, so I, I would have to say up front that that exact deal is, is not part of my, my expertise, but I would say that when we look at um, scientific collaboration, R&D collaboration uh, in, in the Middle East, uh, certainly if the political relations are established that Israel is an important, uh, can be an important partner uh, because of how advanced and technology and R&D sectors. Arif, is there anything you would want to add there? Uh, I'm peace advocate in general, and I hope one day we'll live to see uh, peace all across the Middle East. I, I, I share that, so I appreciate that. And, and I'll just say, maybe taking moderator uh, privilege here that, um, you know, scientific advancement on uh, for peaceful means, non-militaristic means, great. Uh, my, my hope would have been to have seen, uh, you know, my concern, we work a lot in Palestine, of course, is, is the um, ability for everybody to flourish with a, a sense of equality and, and human dignity and freedom. And, and uh, I think that that deal brokers some areas of, of hopefulness, but, but perhaps didn't advance certain other areas where uh, I you know, would hope that everyone in the region can, can experience greater uh, equality and, and, and freedom uh, and opportunity. If I, if I may add one thing, Ronit, yeah. unfortunately, we hear, we hear one peace uh, uh, treaty and news, and we hear 10 new wars somewhere else. So hopefully, at least there should be a balance between how many wars now we have uh, outside the region, even in Azerbaijan and Armenia, unfortunately. Yeah. So uh, we see it's franchising the, the, the uh, we, ho we hope that uh, peace would, would live for everybody. Appreciated. Okay, we're going to move on to other questions. And, and just to say that this, that topic is a whole topic in and of itself. Okay, let's see. So actually one more question uh, from Asher about um, the a MEA awards or MEA awards, MEA awards, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing, funded in part by the Ford Foundation in the 1970s through the 90s had a significant impact on research development in MENA, AUB and AUC in particular. How would you structure a similar program for the 21st century? So when it comes to R&D and, uh, and IP, it sounds like. Arif, do you want to take that? Yeah, as, as I said before, not to repeat on it, I'm a believer in the MENA region of the startup ecosystem. And this is the best way to promote innovation. And it, we, we, uh, we have even incubators. We have got, uh, that, that students and uh, uh, undergrad can be engaged in incubators even before they graduate. So for me, I think this is the best way possible. Definitely, uh, this requires public-private collaboration, etc. Everything we said before is still relevant, but this is the best way for the region, I think now. Um, yes, and, please. And so please. maybe, uh, yeah, maybe maybe just to ask that, since uh, since the Ford Foundation, of course, is a U.S.-based organization, uh, works across the world. But um, I think. Since, since we're talking about skills uh, overall today, I, I think that is uh, one area also where outside actors can have an impact. For example, um, if we're talking about the digital transformation and how uh, you know, I would argue is it's often focused on, on the sort of main urban areas of the region. And so less impoverished and more impoverished areas are at risk of, of being left behind. I think there can be a role for, for example, development and actors to help fund 
educational initiatives that are already uh, led uh, in great parts by civil society um, or in, in conjunction with the private sector in the region to say, um, we can help you fund a, a workshop that is uh, being held in, in, in uh, sort of more impoverished areas to, to really be able to give everyone a chance to be part of this transformation and then get these digital skills that they need to, to participate. Um, so I, I think it's an interesting and important topic to think about where can um, outside actors sort of play a, a meaningful role. Um, while still sort of acknowledging that I, I think the sort of the main driver has to be the local government, the private sector, and civil society. The one thing that I would add to that is um, we're in a new moment in history where just because you leave your home doesn't mean your knowledge is gone. So whereas before we might have thought about brain drain, so let's say you're Jordanian entrepreneurs and you leave for London or Singapore or Dubai or Silicon Valley, and that used to be considered a loss. And I, I would add one more constituency. There's outside actors, there's government, there's the private sector, uh, there's the educational system, but there are also the expats or the, the, you know, the diasporas or the communities that share um, uh, an affinity for the particular place. And those uh, communities, historically, when they left, they were gone. And there were about six different ways that you could access their contributions, maybe coming through tourism or volunteering or buying nostalgic goods, et cetera. We're in a new moment where you can have experts like Amira, who I mentioned earlier, or Rana. Rana can be based in Cambridge out of MIT. Uh, uh, her company is in Cambridge in Massachusetts, but she can be sharing her expertise and mentoring AUC students, not just episodically, but chronically. So you, you have now with technology, the ability to harness the um, brightest and most accomplished minds of a particular community in service of the broader goals uh, of the country or of the region in ways that weren't available even five years ago. And so I, I think that that's a sea change in terms of how we can tap into uh, uh, their, their quasi third party actors because they have an, a stake an affinity, usually family still in the region and, and can play a really um, potentially constructive role if it's also a humble role, if you're, if you're keeping your ear to the ground of what's actually happening, um, but also sharing uh, a vantage point. So for example, if you're working um, out of a place like Silicon Valley, uh, you know, I'll give you a concrete example. Um, Munther Ben Hamida is somebody in charge of supply chains for Apple. And he's out of California. He's Tunisian. And he's able to see a level of scale when it comes to logistics and supply chains that's not possible from Tunisia just by virtue of the size of the country relative to what he is dealing with but he's able to share his expertise to Tunisian students. And so having that exchange is a fundamentally new phenomenon to be able to do it on a daily basis. So that I would say that for governments, thinking about how to tap into that uh, brain circulation more uh, is critical. Marissa, I wanna bring you in because I, I, I think you have some questions that you'd like to address to the panel. So please go ahead. Thank you, thanks for neat. Um, I do have a question and like what, one of the, um, I, I think, very disappointing findings of our uh, research um, over the last two years on workforce development um, was something we heard from many representatives from the private sector. And, and mind you, our case studies were um, Jordan, Tunisia and Oman, so it doesn't represent everyone. But I think it was, it's very telling, which is about the role of the private sector as active agents of change in the development, uh, in the workforce development ecosystem, not just participants um, or observers. And, you know, out of you laid out what CCC is doing, you're definitely leading, you're also a very big company. And the vast majority of companies in the region are small and medium businesses. So they don't see the value in investing in scaling and upskilling. Um, and in fact, some of the medium to big businesses that we talked to as well said, well, it's really not our job to be doing this. Um, you know, we, we can employ and maybe later train, but at the outset, this should be um, uh, a, basically a responsibility held by the government. And the governments are just struggling on so many fronts 
they're bloated, they're constrained financially, they're unable to provide or, or, or basically provide that training through public universities or public schools. So how do you incentivize the private sector, particularly some of the, maybe not so much the small uh, businesses, but some of the medium to, to large businesses and enterprises to actually be following your example, um, Arif at CCC. Um, and Manuel, I'm curious if in your research, you've encountered others that have interesting, uh, you know, tools uh, or strategies um, to do the skilling and reskilling in an innovative way without spending too much of their, um, of their capital on it. Yeah, uh, first, um, I don't think there are two, two, two things I like to talk about that I can definitely sell to small medium business enterprises regarding how they can help like we're helping. Uh, first, if we talk about the social responsibility, I don't think there's a small, medium or large when it comes to social responsibility. You're either social responsible or you're not, okay? Uh, the, the fact that you're bigger means that you can do bigger impact. It can be bigger impact in negative or positive. Okay, so it's, if you're bigger and you're not doing an impact, that's that's even worse. So uh, so from social resp uh, responsibility perspective, everybody's responsible. From uh, sustainability of the business even perspective, it's gonna affect them. If one day they wanna hire and they can't find the right uh, skill and they will have to import that skill from outside their country, it will be much more expensive than them and it might be not be efficient because that skill do not understand the local market. So it's, it's from both. We're not doing it only for social uh, responsibility. We're, we're doing also because it makes sense for the business. So uh, to be sustainable, if you're working now, uh, you need to be responsible. Uh, 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 it's like the environment if we take, I'm not gonna deviate, but sim it's similar. I can say I have nothing to do with that, but one day the environmental impact will, <laughs> will, will hit me back. It won't only hit the big guys. Similarly, when it comes to skills. Very helpful. Um, so we have another question here from Alex Farley at the Wilson Center. Um, and Manuel, before I jump into that, is there anything you would wanna add uh, in addressing Marissa's question? Um, not much at this point. I, I think it is just a stress. I, I think it is a, a big challenge. Um, and, and what Arv has said is, is very helpful. I think also, Again, uh, maybe that's from my, my perspective sort of sitting in Europe. I think also you can think about whether for certain um, upskilling initiatives, there are could be partnerships with development actors. And um, for example, to help bring in also European companies that have an interest in developing talent in the region. Um, so that is, I think, something to think about here. And there's one more thing that that smaller companies can gain, uh, which especially in the startup ecosystem, even the small act of taking interns, for example, um, there is a gap between the desire of students to find internships and the available placements for them to be able to actually engage in internships. Smaller companies, medium-sized companies, it's a great way of building brand awareness and actually building out student ambassadors, especially if you're in a sector that's new or that's innovative. So if you're if you're introducing, let's say you're a gaming company. So for example, Tamatem Games in Jordan, fantastic, fast growing gaming company in the MENA region, incredible culture. Um, if you have people that are coming, not just to work there, but to intern there, they're seeing both why you are a company that is appealing to work at and work for, but also they, they are your potential consumers. So there are companies, the smaller and, and medium size, that stand to benefit from extending these opportunities to students and, and, and many that do. And I think that the more that we highlight them, the more that we celebrate them, um, it's, it's that circular benefit. Uh, just as RF mentioned earlier, if you're training, you can be training up your potential future recruits. Um, and, uh, and you can do it at an early stage. It's, it, it might start with one intern that you take and you place, uh, and then it, that program potentially grows as you grow. So I see here a question from Alex Farley at the Wilson Center. Um, he asks, uh, he said, the panelists emphasize collaboration between educators 
and the private sector, but governance in universities in the region can be very entrenched, centralized, and resistant to new quality assurance standards. Is there hope for new education models, flexibility, and standards to stimulate public higher education? I'll leave this open to whoever wants to jump in. Maybe I'll, I'll take a first uh, stab. I, I think about the entrenchment, which is certainly true of the universities um, in, in some countries, I think maybe that is uh, an important point to say that we should think about um, education also outside of the university framework and to think about um, vocational schools, um, which are sort of, I, I know Marissa and, and Alex have also studied a lot, um, and, and think about sort of how, what skills that they can also in the digital realm more and more so how useful they can be um, in the job market um, also sort of considering that when we think of IT skills there's of course a range of, of skills that are needed and not everyone needs to be a um, software developer that is, is working on artificial intelligence there, there's also other levels where you need um, uh, basic to medium IT skills which are which are very important um, so that is, is, is one way of doing that and maybe um, more punctual sort of workshops that can be done together with the private sector. I mean, something that is um, quite important for the sort of in the digital realm is I think that your skills that you might have gained several years ago at the university it can be outdated quite quickly. Um, and so instead of trying to go back to university um, where maybe the curriculums don't reflect the latest knowledge and there can be more um, workshops that sort of um, teach people the, the latest skills and upskill them in, in that way. I absolutely agree with that. Um, RF, anything you would like to add? Um, I, I would have said exactly what Manuel said. I would just add one thing. Many of the big entrepreneurs that we hear about in the world, they exit even university at the early stage. So uh, uh, the, it's where you get the set of knowledge. And now if, I, if I'm if i trying to convince my kids to, to read more books, which I try all the time and I do read, uh, uh, I don't think I can help it that the source of knowledge and they're getting is far more from social media, YouTube, uh, et cetera, than they get from traditional books uh, that we uh, were, 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 was the only source or pretty much the only source when we were their age. Similarly to university, if, if you copy paste that on university, I don't think that the university will give the majority of the skill set that like it used to be. Okay, and this is uh, referring, we can relate that to what Elon Musk said. He, he, he does not believe in, in the whole uh, school system and he, he created his own school. And uh, 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 I'm not sure if you heard about it, and uh, uh, that, uh, that have a small set of schools and totally new concepts. So I think that we need, um, at a point of time, a revolution in the in the uh, rather than evolution uh, in the education system. And again, as I said before, uh, like parent thinking, I think school thinking, all these systems and the the education system was set in the industrial uh, age uh, in the late 18th century. It evolved only, and that's why we still have uh, more. Uh, 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 more relevant, uh, more more power to the math and science than arts and sports, and uh, 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 in, in many in majority of the school by high uh, that 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 math and science counts far more than anything else, and that's because of the industrial revolution. All these concepts came from there, and they're still there. While we're in the fourth industrial revolution, and the the education system barely catched up. So I I would uh, I'm not education expert. But I can definitely see the problem. I don't have the solution, but I would say I would I would like to see one day a revolution in the sector. I, I absolutely concur. And I, just to add some perspective, because we work with universities across MENA, but also here in the US, this is not unique as a question to, to MENA at the moment. This is universities everywhere are grappling fundamentally with how do they stay relevant? Um, often, uh, just as, as uh, Manuel, you said, by the time you teach it in class, it's, it's usually uh, out of date. It might be too late. Uh, so you see some universities adopting models where they're partnering with boot camps and micro courses to micro credential. You see other institutions instituting more um, a shorter period of time of learning, more working uh, um, 
as I mentioned, HTU in Jordan, as an example where you now have a, a mandatory year of working as part of your, your accreditation. You have some that are moving to the apprenticeship model. There's all kinds of um, experiments being run right now. There's no clear, uh, no clear answer to this. This is a problem. Um, and I think it goes back to the skills of the future that RF, you're talking about creativity, uh, how do you how do you learn to think? How do you learn to be creative? How do you learn to synthesize? Those are the skills that are going to get farther in the coming years than just um, the specific equations or the specific algorithms uh, and the coding. By the time you learn the coding language, it might already be late. <laughs> so how to code? What is the the framework of coding? Is as important as the the specific languages that you're learning. We're coming to time, so we're not going to take any more questions. I do want to turn it to the panelists for any closing thoughts um, that you would like to share. So uh, I'll, I'll work backwards. We, we opened with Arif, so Manuel, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off with any, any final uh, um, reflections. Yeah, I, I think, um, and I, I've learned a lot of during this discussion, so uh, I'm happy to have participated. I, I think sort of for me, um, really, when, when I look at the digital transformation and all this potential and everything that's happening in the in the digital um, startup ecosystem, I think the future can definitely be, be bright for the MENA region. Um, in the end, I think sort of where we need to be careful is, as I said before, is that we include as many people as possible. Um, and it is clear that some will be left behind, unfortunately that we design um, policies and also for um, development actors really um, try to intervene and, and see that there are opportunities for as many people as possible when it comes to developing skills and later on to um, become sort of entrepreneurs. Um, Absolutely, a very important, uh, making sure to design for those who are more vulnerable or who otherwise may be left out. So, um, so uh, you know, I absolutely agree. Um, Arif, please. Yeah, uh, if one thing uh, we learned from COVID-19, uh, I think that if uh, uh, no one is safe until everybody's safe, I think this applies for everything. Okay, if, if one person is left behind, we're all left behind. If we can think in that uh, 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 mentality and, 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 and mindset, I think many of our problems would be solved. And living, as you said, uh, Ronit, before in a globalized wo uh, world, when you said that we can work now from different regions, etc., uh, this does not. We don't see it in the in the unfortunately in the in the scenes. Many of the organizations that were done after World War II, we saw reverse. We saw uh, uh, be it trade organization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And now uh, in a globalized world, I think uh, we should always remember. And skill skill is no exception. That unless uh, we're all safe, no one is safe, unless we're all educated, no one is educated. If we can think that, then we can promote a better world, I think. Amazing, thank you. With that, I'm gonna turn it back to Marissa. It's really been a pleasure speaking with all of you. So thank you so much. And, and Marissa, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Runit, um, for uh, uh, moderating this discussion. Uh, it was really very rich and vibrant and we had excellent questions coming in from our viewers. Um, and thanks to Arif and Manuel um, for participating today and for sharing your um, expertise um, and knowledge. And we hope to continue this discussion, um, uh, moving, moving things forward, uh, particularly for uh, the MENA region. Um, I also wanted to, I mean, the, the issue of the digital divide came up multiple times in this discussion for a very good reason, because we're primarily also discussing um, a digital scale and digitiza digitization um, in, in general. Um, but if, uh, and we are actually hosting a discussion or co-hosting it with the science and technology program at the Wilson Center on the global digital divide, uh, past, present and future. And that's October 30 from 1 p.m. until 2.30. And there will be a speaker from the MENA region to uh, basically zoom in and um, and highlight um, the digital divide there, um, and pr particularly from a gender lens, because that is, as Manuel mentioned, um, is one of the dimensions of it. Uh, but once again, thank you very much for a wonderful discussion and to many more 
um, collaborative activities. Um, and thanks to our viewers for uh, joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you.